Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Mighty Stream, and I am going to pick up where we left off on step one. Hopefully, at this point, you are able to start writing your own answers to your questions. Um, and I want to make sure that you can reach out to me if you want to at recoveryofhope21 at gmail.com, or you can leave a comment down below and let me know uh, that you would like to maybe meet up on Zoom and we can cover your step work together. I'm totally willing to do that. We just have to organize it because I have a very hectic schedule, but I will make the time for you individually to do that. Okay. I do feel we should take a moment of silence though before we get started uh, because I think that sets the tone. So let's go ahead and do that. A moment of silence now, followed by the wee version of the serenity prayer. Thank you. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things that we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Just for today, please and thank you. Again, you can reach me at recoveryofhope21 at gmail.com or leave a comment down below and we can organize. Uh, we can organize ourselves to cover your step. So we're talking about powerlessness. And powerlessness in the flat book is the last subheading on page three. We've already talked about the disease of addiction, denial, hitting bottom, despair, and isolation. So let's pick up with powerlessness at the bottom of page three and let me read it to you. It says, as addicts, we react to the word powerless in a variety of ways. Some of us recognize that a more accurate description of our situation simply could not exist and emit our powerlessness with a sense of relief. Others recoil at the word, connecting it with weakness or believing it to indicate some kind of character deficiency. Understanding powerlessness and how emitting our own powerlessness is essential to our recovery will help us get over any negative feelings we may have about the concept. We are powerless when the driving force in our life is beyond our control. Our addiction certainly qualifies as such an uncontrollable driving force. We cannot moderate or control our drug use or other compulsive behaviors even when they are causing us to lose the things that matter most to us. We cannot stop, even when to continue will surely result in irreparable physical damage. We find ourselves doing things that we would never do if it weren't for our addiction. Things that make us shudder with shame when we think of them. We may even decide that we don't want to use, that we aren't going to use, and realize we are simply unable to stop when the opportunity presents itself. We may have tried to abstain from drug use or other compulsive behaviors, perhaps with some success, for a period of time without a program, only to find that our untreated addiction eventually takes us back of where we were before. In order, let me get ready to go to the next page here. In order to work, the first step, we need to prove our individual powerlessness to ourselves on a deep level. Okay. So we've read this section under powerlessness, and now we're going to get into the questions on page five. There are one, two, three, it looks like seven bullets underneath powerlessness. And you're going to write at the top of your page, powerlessness. You're copying the subheading that we just read, powerlessness. And we're going to be looking at question number one. Okay, question number one on page four. Let me try to highlight this one for you. All right, over what exactly am I powerless? 
and you're going to write question one. You don't need to put the letter A or anything because it just has one question mark. So over what exactly am I powerless? For me, if I were to answer this from the angle of being a new person, I would probably end up writing something in regards to my drug use, my um, desire to stop using and not being able to maintain it, um, not use, or I, I stop using and then I go right back after a little bit. I would probably talk about the drug interaction in my life and the powerlessness that I'm experiencing with that. That's if... I were new, but if I've been around a while and I'm coming back off of a relapse or I am clean in recovery, however, I haven't worked the steps in, the while, in a while, I would say I'm powerless over people, places, and things. I'm powerless over how people respond or treat me. I'm not powerless over, however, how I treat and respond to other people. I would also talk a little bit about my mental health. I would talk about how sometimes I find myself ruminating about things, which is the obsession piece, right? Obsessing. I find myself ruminating about conversations, things that I should have said or wish I would have said. I find myself replaying tapes of interactions with individuals. And it seems like it comes, it's intrusive. It's not something that I say, oh, today I'm going to think about this situation or I'm going to think about. It just seems like it stays with me, like, I, like it's there. It's an automatic negative thought that I don't have any power over, whether or not it comes. However, I do have some power over whether or not it goes. So I would talk about that. Um, and then I would go on to the next question. Over what exactly am I powerless? That's question one, right? Exactly. It wants you to get into the details of it. So don't be afraid to take a long time to answer that. It just depends on what angle you're coming from. Okay, let's look at question number two, bullet number two. I've done things while acting out on my addiction that I would never do when focusing on recovery. What were they? I've done things while acting out on my addiction that I would never do when focusing on recovery. What were they? For me, this bullet number two is saddens me because I know that we all have done things as a direct result of the lifestyle we were living. And some of those things have caused us such shame that we continued using to try to cover over how we felt about them. Some people out of fear will never be able to discuss the truth of this. They have that attitude, I'll take it to my grave. And there, those are things that probably will show up on your fourth step and your fifth step. However, for me, I would say acting out on my addiction. I would say that my promiscuity was a direct result of my disease of addiction. Sex and drugs went together for me. Even if I was in a committed marriage, I would find a way to engage other people. And I don't believe that I would have done that if I was focusing on my recovery the way that I, I should have been, right? Because there was a time period where I was actually clean and new to the rooms and I was still married and promiscuous, okay? So it's not necessarily that I'm clean that stopped the behavior. It didn't stop. But if I'm focusing on recovery, now I'm more conscientious of the behavior and have a willingness to stop it. 
And I did not do that perfectly every time. It took having my third husband for me to be faithful. I want to make that clear. And I've been pretty much in the rooms of Narcotics Anonymous throughout. I got here in 93 and I was married in 1990, okay, to my first husband. So I was in the rooms before I got to, I mean, I was married before I got to Narcotics Anonymous. And my entry into Narcotics Anonymous, it, it didn't make the marriage any better. Right? It didn't make my sexual behavior any better because I wasn't focusing on recovery. There's one other thing I want to share right here. So that's one thing that I would say um, that I would never have done had I been focusing on recovery, not just staying clean. The other thing that comes to mind is the, the manner, disrespectful manner in which I treated my mother. There's some times that she and I went head up against one another. And it was because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I did not want her interfering with my life. And some of the things that I said, to, if I repeated them now, some people might say, oh, that's not so bad. But I was raised to respect my adults in my life, my parents. And I was very disrespectful. And that still bothers me today, even though I know that she has forgiven me. Okay, so that's what your question, your answers are going to look like. They should be some, somewhere around that type of essence, okay? Now let's go on to bullet number three. And it may take you a long time to answer that. And you may have to actually leave a couple of pages in um, your journal to come back to it and answer it. You can briefly note them while we're together now. And then, excuse me, come back later to them. Okay. Question number three, what things have I done to maintain my addiction that went completely against all my beliefs and values? Okay. So... For me, again, the answer here on bullet number three would be my sexual behavior. I believe that in order to maintain my addiction to some extent, because I always have my own money, but in order to maintain my addiction, I was manipulative trying to use someone else's money to sustain my drug of choice. And a lot of times that meant that I was pretending to be in love or in a relationship with them. And there probably during that time were a couple of people that I ended up being in bed with that I just went home with, right? It wasn't like, uh, it was like a one night stand and it wasn't necessarily in my mind that I was prostituting myself. However, that's what it comes down to. Okay, I'm not confused about that. And many of us will say whether or not, what, regardless of our gender, many of us will say and have to admit we prostituted our mind, body, and souls to get that next one. Okay, because my belief and values was that you would only have sex with the person you were married to and you would stay married with them until death did you part. You would have one partner. So for me, this whole concept of being with different people was definitely causing me to have shame. Whether or not I was showing it, it was causing me to have a feeling of guilt and shame that I wasn't living up to my own core values. And so for you, depends on who you are, you may end up listing, um, I became a thief, I became a prostitute, I um, hurt other people intentionally, a con artist to get what I wanted, 
you would just list what that is. And you can spend as little or mu as much time on that as you want. Okay, now let's go to bullet number four. How does my personality change when I'm acting out on my addiction? For example, do I become arrogant, self-centered, mean-tempered, passive to the point where I can't protect myself, manipulative, whiny? So this is question number four. And the other question marks you see in there are just trying to generate thought for you. So you're not going to list four A, B, C, D, and E, and F, right? No, this is just question number four. And then where it says in parentheses, for example, it's giving you examples. It's trying to trigger or initiate thought for you about it. So let me answer number four. How does my personality change when I'm acting out on my addiction? I become very arrogant. I become very arrogant, very aggressive, and very violent. Number five, you see how I answered that? I didn't, it didn't ask me to go into details, right? It said, how does my personality change? It didn't ask us to go into any great detail. And I answered how I feel my personality changes, right? So you do the same. Now, number five, do I manipulate other people to maintain my addiction? This one is kind of related to number three. And then how? Do I manipulate other people to maintain my addiction? How? So this one is a closed-ended question. Number 5A is closed-ended, meaning that it's just a yes or no. However, the second question, 5B, that says how, is now asking you to relate why you answered what you did in 5A. So do I manipulate other people to maintain my addiction? 5A, yes. 5B, how? I did this by creating a sense of love and relationship with people that I could care less about. Point blank period. I made these men think that I was in love with them and would be with them for the rest of my life even though my intention was to get what I could from them. And when I was tired of them, which I knew they had personality issues that I really didn't like, I would put up with it so, far, so long, but I knew in my mind that at some point in time, I would use their character defects that I didn't like and knew that I didn't like to be the reason or the way that I got away from them generally after, not after I sucked them dry, but after I got all that I thought that I wanted and needed. So I would create a pretense with individuals that I was more into them than I actually was. And that's wrong. So how did you manipulate people to maintain your addiction? And you answer that. Let's go on to six. Have I tried to quit using and found that I couldn't? So that's 6A. Have I quit using on my own and found that my life was so painful without drugs that my abstinence didn't last very long? That's 6B. What were these times like? 6C. So 6A and 6B are closed ended, yes or no? And then 6C, what were, were these times like? So for me, have I tried to quit using and found that I couldn't? No. I didn't find that I was using and, and stopped and that I couldn't stay stopped. I stayed stopped. But for you, you may not have stayed stopped. Now, if you're talking about some behaviors, I could say yes. So if I'm coming at it from the angle of where I'm at today, have I tried to quit using people and found that I couldn't stop? Then I would write yes. So that's when your sponsor 
will tell you or you need to know the angle in which you're doing your step one. Sometimes after you've been clean for a while and using drugs is not the issue and you've gone so long without ever doing your step work, you are going to be talking or incorporating other issues besides just not using drugs. So what you could do under 6A, you could say drugs and then a dash and talk about that experience. Other issues you could put a dash and then talk about that. Because when it comes to other behaviors, of course, I try to stop and then went back to it, using people, right? You have to just answer according to where you're at right now and not complicate it. If this is your first time going through the steps and it's been a while since you've been in the program and you stay clean, I would just go from the angle of, um, the drugs and how it was for you when you were using drugs and, and first got you. Because you always want to be able to look at your step work from the point of view that you sorted it out in regards to drug use, and then you went on to apply it to other areas of your life. You, you want to have that experience. But I will say the fact that you're doing your step one is what's most important, and there's no wrong way. The only wrong way to do a step one is not to do it, okay? And then 6B, have I quit using on my own and found that my life was so painful without drugs that my abstinence didn't last very long? Now, I would say here, for me, I would have to say yes, but I didn't go back to using drugs. I went back to using sex and people, okay? For you, it may be that you, the pain of not using became so great that you needed to go back to it. You chose to go back to it, to using the drugs. I heard someone the other day in a meeting say that not using drugs caused them to have more pain. And that makes sense, not using drugs because the drugs are mind and mood altering. So your awareness of what's really going on is changed, it's altered. That's why they call it mind and mood altering. So you could be going through horrendous pain, use drugs, and it doesn't feel painful at all. But as soon as you stop using the drugs, now all of a sudden you're very much aware of that pain, so that makes sense, okay? It's a common thing that we all deal with. You, you're not unique if that's the case for you. You're not unique in that way. We've all passed through that. What were these times like? For me, these times were horrible to not have a drug in my system and still be displaying the same behavior. Because now it looks like the drugs were never the cause for the reason why I was so promiscuous. It looks different now. There was a reason. There was something else that was going on because now the drugs aren't there, but I'm still behaving the same way. And it quite honestly depressed me even more. So it's painful to realize that I actually had some character flaws that had to be addressed and it wasn't due to the drugs. And it caused me to have some level of shame and self-hatred, self-loathing. You mean to say that the drugs aren't why I use people? There was something else? Because I don't have the drugs now and I'm still using them like they're nothing. Very disconnected. My heart was very disconnected from human interaction. And in that sense, I would say that I had been reduced to animalistic level of living. My heart was rarely attached to any encounter with any human being that I had. I shut that off and I needed to figure out why. But at this point in step one, that's what those times were like. They caused me to hate myself even more. And I had to figure out how I was going to hold on to this miracle of recovery long enough to change so that I could see 
happiness and become happy, joyous, and free again, or for the first time in some instances. Okay, now we're at number seven. You see how simple this is? You see how simple this is when someone shows you how to do it. Coffee there, so I had to take a quick pause. Okay, so now I have highlighted for you the seventh question. This is question number seven under section powerlessness, but it will be section number four, basically. You'll have the heading there, powerlessness, and we're on our last question. See how easy this is, right? When someone shows you. Number seven, how has my addiction caused me to hurt myself or others? My addiction caused me to hurt myself because I, and others, but let me talk about myself first. Because I treated this body of mine as though it had no value. I treated this body as though it had no value. I would not speak up if someone touched me inappropriately because I did not value my body. And that alone caused me harm. Because now you're having these experiences of rape and you're not speaking up. It's different if I tell you I'll sleep with you and I sleep with you or make out with you, and I'm doing it because I want, compared to having someone impose themselves upon you because you happen to be the highest one in the room and you, you don't even have a voice because of your own personal shame to even be in that predicament or you're fearful that they'll beat you. So I caused myself a lot of harm because the drug, the disease of addiction, the using of drugs took my voice away. And I did not speak up for myself when I should have. And so I endured several sexual assaults that were never treated by the law the way that they should have been. It's kind of what it, you get in your mind that it, this is what goes along with being out there. There's going to be some people that are going to force themselves on you. And you internalize it and say that that was justified or you don't really feel it's justified because you know the power of a yes and a no. But you don't have what you need in that mind altered state to do what you need to do. Now, I did indicate that the disease of addiction changed my personality and I became arrogant and violent. And, and there were some instances in this seven, this bullet number seven, there were some instances where I had just had enough and I became very violent. Like, you're not going to do that to me again, right? So there were some instances, don't get me wrong, where I, I became very aggressive and violent. But a lot of times the aggression and violence was in trying to protect other people, but I didn't have a voice when it came to protecting to myself. Um, and I would become the voice of the voices. I hope that makes sense. Or for others, how did I hurt others? I hurt others by also demeaning the value of their bodies, not assaulting them, but not taking the intimacy seriously and letting them think that it was more than it actually was, right? So that's my uh, section of powerlessness, seven, seven bullets there. 
And I hope that this has been helpful for you and give, gives you something to think about. You can see how people can confuse doing step work with uh, being too painful to get they're afraid of what's in the Pandora box because of the type of questions that are here make you go deeper. But it's allowing you to look at the powerlessness, certain sections of your disease of addiction and how it manifested itself. It wants to get you to the end of this step one where you are convinced in your mind beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are an addict. You're powerless over the disease of addiction. And that disease of addiction manifests itself mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. And that your life had become unmanageable. And it's going to demonstrate for you in this next section through the questions how unmanageable your life had actually become. So by the time you get done with this step one, you not only believe you need to be restored to sanity, you believe that you can be. And then you will go into step two. Okay, so hopefully that's helpful. I'm sure that it is for many of you. If you have friends that are struggling with getting their step work done, I want you to share this link with them um, and let them start out at the beginning. And we will get you into the process of working the steps. We will get you into that process and your life will be forever changed for the better. My name is Mighty Stream and I've enjoyed this time with you. Have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful day on purpose.